very excited to host uh, Mr. Tom Wainwright for his first visit to the Council this evening to discuss the economics of, of drug cartels. Um, due to the challenges of travelling in February, to Tom's had a, a pretty torrid journey here today. He spent most of the time in airport lounges across Texas, so we're especially appreciative that he's here. Um, copies of Tom's latest book, Narconomics, How to Run a Drugs Cartel, will be available for sale and signing after the programme from our partners, the bookseller. Uh, before we begin, some quick housekeeping points. We are on the record this evening. Um, we uh, welcome social media, but please silence your phones. Um, and uh, we're not live streaming, but we are recording th this evening's program. Uh, upcoming programs at the Chicago Council in March include uh, March 8th, the Council on Foreign Relations' Adam Siegel, in conversation with UI Labs' Carolyn Nowinski Collins on how the cyber realm is reshaping international relations. On March uh, 23rd, Wednesday, March 23rd, the Washington Post's David Ignatius will be discussing the lessons of the Syrian civil war for US policymaking. And on Thursday, March 31st, Yale economist Jeffrey Garton and the Financial Times' Edward Luce will be discussing the past and future of globalization. The Chicago Council is a public education institution generously funded by its members and donors and we aim to make conversations like this evening's open to as wide an audience as possible. So we, we thank you for your support. Um, turning back to this evening's program, I'll return later to moderate the audience Q&A. But first, to introduce tonight's topic and speaker, please join me in welcoming the uh, founder and president of Obsturga Incorporated and Obsturga Consulting, a US Coast Guard specialist and professor of policy and political philosophy, and Chicago Young Professionals Ambassador, uh, Professor D. Vincent Thomas, Jr. Good evening. Nothing brings people out like uh, talking about narcotics. Uh, I actually came straight here from one of my classes. I teach medical ethics at Elmhurst College this semester, and the topic of medical ethics was medical marijuana, and usually my students skip the class, but today every single student showed up. <laughs> uh, very interesting discussion at a college campus. Uh, but good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. I am delighted to be here this evening to welcome Tom Wainwright to the Chicago Council to discuss the critical topic of drug cartels. This is a timely issue, in fact, because next month the United Nations General Assembly will hold a special session on drugs. The aim of this session is to work towards an international coordinated strategy for countering the narcotics trade by reducing both the demand and supply of illegal narcotics. This focus on supply and demand hints at the underlying business logic that drives the global drug trade. So much of the debate over drug policy has focused on the enforcement, punishment, and increasingly the treatment of addiction over incarceration. But it is a question of whether these approaches alone can stem the drug trade in and of itself. I can attest to this personally as a member of the United States Coast Guard. During my active duty time, I was counter-narcotics and counter-terrorism. During this time, I patrolled the East Pacific, where we sailed from U.S.-Mexico border down to Colombia and back from San Diego up to Vancouver, Canada, across to the U.S.-Russian maritime boundary line and back. And during this time, I was personally responsible for helping coordinate uh, counter-narcotics operations to seize and or capture uh, well over 10 tons of illegal narcotics trafficking in international waters. So I can tell you it is very much a business strategy. Uh, over the years, traffickers have gotten smarter. They've gotten faster. Uh, Semi-submersibles and fully submersibles are not gimmicks. They're absolutely real because I've seen them. So. It is no secret that the efforts of counter-narcotics operations, military and civilian alike around the world, have done little to reduce the enormous profits made by cartels. Cartels are foremost businesses, and today they can boast over a quarter billion customers and over $300 billion in annual revenue, the United States being the number one consumer of illegal narcotics. They are also increasingly organized along the lines of Fortune 500 companies, complete with human resources, outsourcing, and corporate responsibility functions, literally. With cartels resembling multinationals, mighty economics and business theory hold the key to their defeat. Can policymakers harness market forces to disrupt the drug trade? This is the essential question. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Mr. Tom Wainwright with, with us to explore these questions and potential solutions. 
By way of brief introduction, Mr. Wainwright is Britain editor of The Economist, former, former Mexico City bureau chief for The Economist, covering Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, as well as parts of South America and the United States. Mr. Rain, Mr. Wainwright also is also author of Narconics, Narconomics, excuse me, How to Run a Drug Cartel, where he makes the argument that by analyzing the cartels as companies, law enforcement might better understand how the cartels operate and can thus stop throwing away $100 billion a year in a futile effort to win the war against what is tantamount to a highly organized conglomerate. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Wainwright to the Chicago Council. Thanks, Vincent, and thanks, Ian, and thanks everybody for being here today on this cold evening. And uh, it's great to see so many people here. But I'm not sure if I should be encouraged or concerned that there are so many people in Chicago who, don't, who want to know more about how to run a drug cartel. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's very good to see you all here. Um, I thought I should probably start by sort of explaining myself, really, and explaining how I came to write this rather unusual book about how to run a cartel, which wasn't really exactly what I had in mind when I first started studying economics. Um, it first really began when I got sent out to Mexico in 2010 for The Economist. And out there, I was covering Mexico, Central America, bits of the Caribbean, South America. And when I got there, I mean, uh, although the, if you read the blurb on the jacket of my book, it makes me sound terribly sort of intrepid. To be honest, uh, when I got there, I was expecting it to be kind of a fun job where I'd be, you know, writing about a bit of business, sort of the oil industry, the car industry, maybe the odd fun story about tequila or tourism, that kind of stuff. But when I got there, I, I arrived in 2010, and at more or less the same time, the, the drug war arrived in Mexico. And it was a really strange time to be there. I mean, the, the murder rate was going through the roof. The murder rate doubled in the space of just two or three years. And I quickly found that when I was there, you know, it was, you'd go to interviews, you'd go to parties or business roundtables or events like this. And very often, it wasn't long before the subject returned to the, the business of, of drugs and, and the drug war. It was really, you know, the, the subject. And so I found myself writing about it a lot more than I'd expected. And so I got into this um, routine of writing about, say, you know, ordinary business one week, uh, you know, cars or whatever, and, and then the drugs business the next week. And the more I did this combination of the two week by week, the more I came to see that actually the, the drug story was in fact a great big business story. So I started writing more about drugs as if it were a business, and I, I began to ask the kind of questions of people involved in this business, whether as entrepreneurs or as regulators, the kind of questions that I would ask of people if I were covering any other business. I'll give you an example. Uh, soon after I got there, um, there was this incredible story in Mexico. You may have seen it on the news. In 2010, the Mexican police discovered this enormous cache of marijuana on the outskirts of Tijuana. It was a really huge amount. It was more than 100 tons, and it was, I think at the time, the single biggest drug seizure that the Mexicans had ever made. And it was a, a really amazing sort of event. They got all this stuff. It was bale after bale of, of cannabis that was hidden in a couple of shipping containers in a warehouse on the edge of the city. And they got it all, they unloaded it, they unpacked it, and they made it into this gigantic bonfire. They piled it all up, hosed it down with gasoline, and lit the thing, set the whole thing alight. And it all went up in smoke. And you can just imagine you know, that they had soldiers on guard making sure that no one stood downwind of this stuff. because. It was basically the world's biggest joint. <laughs> and so, anyway, this was burning away. And at the time, the Mexican government was proudly talking about how much all this was worth, you know, how, how big a blow against organized crime it, it really represented. And it was widely reported that all of this marijuana, this 100 tons or so, was worth maybe about half a billion dollars. Sounded like a huge amount. And, you know, like everybody else, I was impressed by this. But I began thinking about it a bit more. and. I was thinking, you know, half a billion dollars, th that's a stunning amount. There aren't many companies in the world that could survive a, a shock like that. And the cartels, you know, they're big, but they're not, they're not that big. And so half a billion, I, I sort of I gave it some thoughts and I started to pick it apart a bit more. And I looked into how they'd come up with this figure and it was fairly straightforward. They'd, they'd got what they reckoned was a sort of conservative estimate for the retail price of marijuana in the States because that's where it was all going. 
Um, and they came up with a rough figure of maybe about $5 per gram as a sort of conservative low estimate. And they multiplied that out over 100 tons. So if you do the maths, it's fairly straightforward. You get to about half a billion. And it sounds, you know, sounds reasonable enough. But if you give it a moment's thought, it's completely ludicrous. Uh, imagine if you did that with any other ordinary product. Imagine doing that with coffee. And you, it would be the equivalent of saying, okay, so the retail price of a cup of coffee in the States in Starbucks is, uh, what is it, three or four dollars or something like that. And in that cup, you get maybe two grams of coffee. So you're talking about maybe a couple of dollars per gram. So if you intercept a kilo of coffee in Mexico or Colombia, on that basis, it must be worth $2,000. Obviously not true, right? Obviously not the case. And uh, yet yeah, with drugs, we, we do this very readily. Uh, think of, you know, imagine doing the same thing, trying to calculate the price of a, a cow in Argentina and doing it based on the price of a steak in Chicago. It would just be mad. You'd get a, a much, much higher figure than what it, what it really should be. So I did um, very rough calculations to try and come up with a more accurate estimate of this Tijuana bust. Um, and it's fairly straightforward. I just I got the wholesale price of marijuana in Mexico much, much lower, as you'd expect. It's about $0.08 cents per gram, not $5 per gram. So that 100 tons or so, I mean, it, it wasn't nothing, but it was worth probably a bit less than $10 million, not half a billion dollars. So, you know, a bit less than 2% of what we thought. So I started thinking, you know, what, what does this mean? If, if we're getting this kind of thing wrong repeatedly and very, you know, unthinkingly, because in the war on drugs, we apply a totally different sort of economic reasoning to the one that we apply elsewhere, then how might this be leading us astray? And there was one interesting example actually just last year. I was down in Texas this morning, which is partly why I was so late today. Um, and last year, the Texas Department of Public Safety was doing a big review of the effectiveness of its policies. And they estimated the value of a load of drugs that they'd intercepted during a given period. They reckoned it was about $160 million. But last year, for the first time, they decided that instead of reporting in wholesale terms, they'd report in retail prices. And so with the click of a button on an Excel spreadsheet, this $160 million became nearly $2 billion. And I, it, it just struck me that if you're a Texan taxpayer and, and you're being told what your money is going towards, it sounds a whole lot more convincing if you're told that it's been used to strike a $2 billion blow against organized crime than it does if actually it's only worth $160 million. So uh, taking this, I, I wondered, you know, how would this apply to other drugs, other parts of the supply chain? And the one that really interested me was cocaine, because that has long been the arguably the most profitable uh, drug for the Latin American cartels. So I went down to Bolivia, and all of the world's cocaine comes from just three countries. It's all from Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. So I went down there, and I, I wanted to try and find out more about what things happen at the very beginning of, of the business. I mean, literally the roots of the business, because that's where all the coca bushes are grown, coca being the leaf from which you make cocaine. So I organized um, a trip to go and see this stuff being grown, and I, I got hold of this guide who could take me there, and he showed up in his uh, rather battered old Toyota Land Cruiser and introduced himself as Osama Bin Laden, which was not entirely encouraging, and it turned, it turned out it was just he had this gigantic black beard, and so he was known to his friends as Bin Laden. Anyway, off we went into the Andes, Bin Laden and I, and <laughs> we um, traveled for a few hours out of La Paz, and we eventually ended up in this village where they, they grow coca, and it's an incredible sight. They, they cut these terraces into the mountainsides, very, very steep slopes there, and so they, they cut these terraces in there, and they grow the leaves in there. And walking around this village, it was an incredible sight that you had the people growing the coca leaf. They weren't really cartel types. You know, the, it, there was families out there doing it. I saw children picking the leaves because this is the kind of village where, you know, there's no daycare, no childcare. And so it really is a, a family business. And I, I got kind of interested in how the supply chain there works because for, for economists, there's a bit of a puzzle in the cocaine business. The way that the sort of reasoning behind the war against cocaine is fairly straightforward. The idea is that you want to try and reduce the supply of the coca leaf. And if you cut into the supply, then other things being equal, you'd expect the price to go up. Fairly straightforward economics. And if the price goes up, then again, you'd expect people to consume less of the stuff. And yet that isn't really what's happened. Over the years, the governments of Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru 
have actually done quite a good job of trying to cut down on coca leaf production. They've dumped turn after turn of weed killer from helicopters and planes. They've sent the army out to go and pick these bushes up by the roots. And they've every year destroyed more and more. These days, every year, they destroy an area of coca bush about the same as 14 times the area of Manhattan. It's a huge, huge area. And remember, this is all in remote parts of the Andes. Everywhere they risk treading on landmines or being shot at by cartels. It, you know, it's, it's a really, really impressive thing that they do. And yet, in spite of all this success, there hasn't really been much impact at all on the price of cocaine. If you look at the retail price of cocaine in the States over the past couple of decades, it's hardly changed at all. It's bumped around you know, roughly $150 per pure gram for most of that time. It's, it's a bit less on the street because what you buy on the street is less than pure. But the pure price is about $150 a gram. So I was wondering, you know, how can this be? It's, it seems as if the cartels have defied the basic laws of economics. If you cut supply and demand remains steady, then price ought to, ought to rise. And this reminded me of uh, a case from the legitimate business world. It, it, there is one company that sometimes is in the news for similar reasons. When Even when there's a shock to supply, it manages to maintain the same low prices for consumers. And that shop is Walmart. Very often you read about this. I, you, you read about um, uh, shocks to supply in, in a business like, for instance, so let's say the, the apple business or something like that. You could have a, a failed apple harvest and a, a reduction in the supply of apples. You'd expect the price to go up. And yet somehow, miraculously, Walmart manages to, to maintain its, its incredibly low prices. And people say of Walmart that the reason that it's able to do this is because it exercises what's called a, a monopsony, which is like a, a monopoly of demand in certain markets. In other words, it's by far the biggest buyer of apples from farmers in, in some areas. It's a, almost the only buyer in some particular parts of the world. And because it has this dominant position, it's able effectively to set the price. The farmers say, look, we've got less stock this year, so we're going to raise our prices. And Walmart says, well, sorry, we're the main buyer, and you know the price is going to stay at this level. And for that reason, the, the retail price remains the same. And so I wondered if something similar was going on in the cocaine business. And I looked into it, and it turns out that it may very well be that something like that is going on. There was a good study done by a pair of academics who looked into this very question, and they cross-referenced data on the eradication of coca leaf with local data on coca leaf prices. And they found that, amazingly, there was exactly no relationship between the level of eradication and the change in the price of the leaf. And what they speculate is, is precisely this. It's that what's going on is that in each area, a given cartel or armed group, it could be a Mexican cartel or it could be a group like the FARC, has uh, effectively a monopsony. They're the main or only buyer in one given area. And so whatever happens to supply, they're able to say to the growers, sorry guys, this is the price. So it doesn't change for them. Uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't change for consumers either. And so it's not the case that these efforts to destroy coca leaf are having no effect. Trouble is that they're having an effect on the wrong people. It's not really hitting the cartels. It's not really hitting consumers in America or in Europe. The people it is hitting are the farmers, and they're making about a dollar a day in some places. So it seems as if uh, the, the efforts that are being made there are, are falling in the wrong place. It also struck me that even if you do manage to raise prices there, it, it's far from clear that it would have a very big impact. And if you think back to the example of the, the Tijuana marijuana and, and the real cost of the stuff there, something very similar goes on in the cocaine business. The way that the cocaine supply chain works is that the value of the coca leaf required to make a kilo of marijuana. In Colombia, all that leaf, you, you need about a ton of fresh coca leaf to make a kilo of marijuana. And in Colombia, that ton is worth only about $400. That kilo in the United States at retail level is worth about $150,000. So imagine if you were very, very successful and you managed to double the price of that coca leaf from 400 to 800. And imagine if that entire extra cost were transferred to the consumer in the States, which may not be the case, but imagine that it is. All you would succeed in doing is raising the price of that kilo from 150,000 to 150,400. Or think of it on the per gram level, you'd raise the price of a gram, a pure gram, from $150 to $150 and 40 cents. And that's assuming an incredibly effective program in South America where you manage to double the cost of coca 
And if you want a good parallel, the, the way that I sometimes explain this to people is by saying, imagine if you were trying to do this in the market for artwork, for paintings. It's like saying, okay, we want to raise the price of paintings. The main ingredient of paintings is paint. So what we're going to do, we're going to drive up the price of a box of paints from $50 to $100. And on that basis, we confidently expect that this million dollar painting is going to double in value to $2 million. Obviously not, right? It's not going to happen. And exactly the same thing is true in the coca business. So with this in mind, I was sort of worried about, you know, quite what we might be getting wrong, quite how badly we might be going wrong. And I wondered what would be happening lower down the supply chain and uh, in different parts of the drugs business. So I went to have a look at what was going on in El Salvador. And El Salvador is in the news at the moment. You may have seen last year it, it racked up the highest murder rate of any country in the world. It's got a very, very big problem with organized crime. And most of those murders there are uh, committed by a couple of big gangs. The, they're known as the Mara Salvatrucha and Barrio Dieciocho, or the 18th Street Gang. They both got branches here in the United States, as a matter of fact. And so I went to see the head of one of these gangs, the, the head of the 18th Street Gang. And he was in this prison on the ex edge of um, San Salvador, although it didn't seem to stop him from doing his business at all. He was still carrying out all his cartel operations in just the same way. And I went to see him, and this prison was an extraordinary place. It was supposedly actually not a very high security prison by Salvadoran standards, but you wouldn't have thought so to look at it. Outside, uh, there were soldiers hiding behind sandbags with machine guns. It was a, an incredibly high security place. The roof was falling in inside. It was in terrible condition. It was a, a, an extraordinary place for this guy to be running his business from, but that's precisely what he was doing. And so we sat down, and um, this guy named Carlos Mojica uh, sat down opposite me, and he wasn't my typical sort of business interviewee. He's one of these El Salvador Mareros that you may have seen pictures of covered literally from head to toe in tattoos. He's got one going across his forehead saying, in, in memory of my mother, covered in tattoos saying number 18, which is the name of his gang. And his arms were this sort of mess of tattoos and scars. And anyway, we sat down and started talking about business. And the more we talked, the more it became clear to me that for him, one of the big sort of problems that he faces in his organization is managing his staff, if you like, managing his human resources. And when you think about it, it, it is, it's a problem for him. It, it, the two main gangs in the area, the Salvatrucha and the 18th Street Gang, have about 70,000 members in Central America. And just for comparison's sake, that's about the same number of people that are directly employed by General Motors here in the United States. So fairly big organizations. And managing all those people is tough. It's especially tough when you're in prison. But they have a couple of particular problems which are, are unique to to the cartels. One is that, of course, they have a very, very high turnover of their staff. I mean, you've heard about the high murder rate there. Many of them get killed, and those who don't get killed often are um, um, arrested. There was one interesting study that I read of the cocaine smuggling business uh, from the Caribbean to the UK, and th there was an interview with one of the people who ran this business, and he estimated that about one in four of all his mules got arrested on the way over. So imagine trying to run a business like that. Imagine trying to run one of your businesses. Imagine trying to run a newspaper in which a quarter of your staff have to be replaced every year. It's, it's really difficult. And this difficulty is compounded, of course, by the fact that they can't advertise for new staff. You know, they can't put an ad in the paper. They can't look on LinkedIn. And so we were talking about the difficulties that, um, that he has. And the thing that I thought was particularly sort of interesting about this is, is that they... As far as the cartels are concerned, you know, if, if they wanted to solve this very, very tough problem that they have, the ideal thing for them, if they could do it, would be to set up a kind of job center for, for criminals. And I guess what it would involve would be getting together all the unemployed young men with criminal records in the country, putting them in one place, and allowing the cartels to take their pick and, and recruit them. And if you wanted to make it really easy for them, you know, you could even lock these guys in there and keep them in there for several years. And I mean, you can see where I'm going with this. This is exactly what we've created for them. We've built these things called prisons, which it turns out are precisely where the gangs overcome this human resources problem. It's where they do all their recruiting. And to get a flavor of this, it's, I think it's hard to really imagine the extent to which gangs and cartels run prisons in Latin America. But they really do. I mean, this guy, Carlos, who I interviewed in his jail in El Salvador, 
came to see me immaculately dressed in his box fresh sneakers and it, it was clear that he was really running the place there was an interesting um investigation a few years ago of a, a jail in acapulco in mexico uh when uh, some government investigators went in and in there in this prison they found um 101 fighting roosters they found 19 prostitutes living there and they found two peacocks that were just roaming around because it was what the what the gangsters had decided they wanted and there was another jail in mexico where the prisoners had between them equipped this one particular cell um that they were auctioning to the highest bidder and they'd equipped it with air conditioning and a dvd player and a mini bar and so that it's it's clear that they use these prisons um, to recruit, and it's not just in Latin America that this happens. There's a good example actually from the United States, uh, the case of Carlos Leda, who, for those of you who are watching Narcos on Netflix, you'll have come across him. He has a claim to be the person who really introduced America to cocaine, and his cocaine career really came about when he was put in prison in Connecticut by chance, along with a guy called George Young, and. It was a, a perfect match. George Young was in there for trafficking marijuana from um, uh, Mexico, I believe, into the States by plane. Carlos Leda had contacts in Colombia, and the rest is history. They, they began trafficking in cocaine by plane, and um, America picked up its addiction. And this all happened because the two were put together in jail, and Carlos Leda later described this jail as being like his college. So I wondered, you know, what would happen in countries where things were done differently, where unlike in Latin America, the prisons were somewhat harder for people to use as, um, as recruitment centers. And I found this interesting study done in the European Union. It was a study done for the European Commission a few years ago. Really fascinating one actually, a, a study of what happens when big cocaine deals go wrong. And the investigators had looked at about 30 deals, really big deals, all involving at least 20 kilos of cocaine. So that's kind of upwards of half a million dollars worth in Europe, and some of them were involving several tons, so multi-million dollars. And they looked at all these cases, and, and the way in which these deals went wrong sometimes was just extraordinary. There was one big deal that went wrong when um, somebody accidentally faxed the details of the operation to the wrong number. There was a, another one that went wrong when um, a great big shipment of cocaine was successfully sent to the Netherlands, and it arrived in the port of Rotterdam, but the people in the Netherlands were waiting in Antwerp. They got the wrong place. There was another one, I think my favorite example was one where there was a very, very elaborate plan to import lots of cocaine from somewhere in South America where they'd built these special metal tubes and filled those with cocaine and then stuck them to the hull of a ship whose crew apparently uh, was none the wiser about this. And the ship made its way across the Atlantic thousands of miles and it docked in, in the Netherlands successfully. And the idea was that a couple of divers would go down and pick the stuff up, pick, pick the stuff up off the hull of the boat. But according to the police reports, they became ill during the operation, and it sounds as if they got seasick underwater, <laughs> and they had to call the whole thing off. And the best thing about this is that, as far as anybody knows, this cocaine is still there, strapped to the bottom of this boat, sort of roaming the world. <laughs> but the surprising thing about this, that what the study looked at was what happened next. You know, what was the aftermath of these these terrible mistakes? And uh, you know, you'd expect that if you're watching an episode of Narcos or The Wire or something like that, when something like that goes wrong, then you expect heads to roll, literally. You you'd expect the gang to take a terrible revenge. And yet, what this study found was that in two-thirds of those cases, no violence was used as a result. And it seems kind of strange, but th there was a good example in there of one particular deal involving a, a Dutch importer of cocaine called Pete. And Pete was doing this big deal um, involving bringing in 20 kilos of the stuff from South America. The drugs arrived and he had a look. Twelve of these kilos were fine, but eight were bad quality. And he complained, he rang up the, uh, the exporter and complained that it was like chalk, you know, it wasn't good stuff. And you'd have expected him maybe to take some revenge, but in fact what happened was that the exporters, uh, effectively its customer service operations swung into action and they called him back and they said, look, we're really sorry about this, it's an unusual lapse in quality. And they offered to send a guy over, a guy they called an engineer, they sent him over to the Netherlands to improve the quality of the stuff and the deal was resolved without the use of violence. There was another case later when Pete was up to his old tricks importing cocaine again and a mule was meant to bring a suitcase of the stuff through an airport in Brazil. But the mule got cold feet at the airport and panicked and left the suitcase behind. And again, you'd expect that mule not to last very long if this were an episode of Breaking Bad or something. But in the end, again, Pete was persuaded to, to let him off. And 
the conclusion that the researchers drew in this particular case, this study in Europe, was that for cartels and gangs in Europe, violence is very much used uh, as a, you know, rather reluctantly. And the, r the reason that they came up with isn't because European gangsters are any nicer than Latin American ones. The, the reason they posited is that in Europe, the human resources problem is such that replacing employees is rather a lot harder and making those contacts is harder as well. Contrast that with El Salvador where the it's so easy to hire a new employee that you can send them off to kill each other and not worry too much about the turnover and you can really see the difference and I think in economic terms what's going on it's just a difference in the labor market. I, in El Salvador they've got a lot of slack, if you like, in their labour market. It's very easy for them to hire new people, there are very, very few barriers to making new hires. In a country like the Netherlands, where the prison system is better run and policing is better done, it's a much tighter labour market. Hiring new people is much, much harder. And for that reason, they seem less likely to use violence. Anyway, I think I'm coming close to the end of this, but uh, just to finish off, uh, I wanted to just point out that... Uh, Whatever really, you know, whatever people think about the way the war on drugs is, is fought, it's fairly clear that if you look at the numbers over the past few years, that it hasn't really been going all that well. Uh, as Vincent mentioned, there's a big UN summit on this just next month. It's the first one they've done in nearly 20 years. And the last one they did 20 years ago, the sort of slogan of that summit was a drug-free world, we can do it. And since then, if you look at the quantity of drugs consumed, uh, worldwide, the amount of marijuana consumed has gone up by 50%. The amount of cocaine consumed has gone up by 50%. The amount of opiates consumed has nearly trebled. And all of this while we're spending billions of dollars on, on trying to stop it and expending thousands of lives on doing the same thing. So it seems to me that whatever we're doing, we're not making a terribly good job of it. And that's why I wonder if it's time for a, a new approach. And so this idea of using economics and business theory to look at the cartels. Um, I wonder if it's one worth, uh, worth taking seriously. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much. We'll now open up to audience Q&A. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And we'll have microphones going around. We'll take Adele on the front row first, please. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your comments. It's a big topic and people need to know more about it. My question is about legalization of marijuana and whether that would then successfully separate a significant portion of drug users who then move on to the next grade from going further into the system and getting into the criminal part of it. I think that's true, yeah. Um, I mean, the legalization is an interesting one. It's, as you know, the, I think no country's gone further with it so far than, than your country, than the states. And the, from I think from the point of view of the cartels, it's a big worry actually for them. I mean, for some cartels, if you look at say the Sinaloa cartel, which is the one run by this guy El Chapo, who's constantly in and out of prison, um, that one makes nearly half of all its revenues from marijuana. It's a really big money spinner for them. And I think for them, the fact that this particular drug now has a very serious, or they have a very serious competitor in the form of legal business is a big deal for them. Um, it's, uh, there's some interesting anecdotal evidence actually about how it seems to be affecting them. Uh, there's been an increase in the number of very large seizures of marijuana near the border on the Mexican side, which suggests that they're finding it harder to, to sell the stuff north of the border. Um, and similarly, there are more reports as well of cartels using their uh, drug smuggling tunnels for trafficking people instead, for trafficking migrants. And economically, that doesn't really make much sense. I mean, the, the people trafficking business is much less profitable than the drug trafficking business. And to risk a sort of expensive asset like a drug tunnel, it, it, you know, from, from their self-interested point of view, doesn't make much sense. And it, it implies that they're really struggling with the drug side of the business. In terms of the sort of diversion of people from the legal system, I mean, yes, it's, it's absolutely the case that the fewer people that get criminal records for, for what most people consider a relatively minor offense, the better. I mean, about 45% of Americans admit to having tried marijuana. And it, there's a clear inconsistency in the fact that this, in theory, is an offense that can get you sent to jail. I mean, it's, it's, it's a law which, in de facto terms, has been decriminalized in much of the country already. Um, I think in terms of getting people also, you, you talked about you know moving people further down the track. There's a, an interesting question as well about um, what legalization might do in terms of um, moving people on or not moving them on to trying other drugs too. And th this is something that they found in the Netherlands. The, the experiment that they've had underway there for a very long time is uh, you know, selling the stuff legally in these so-called coffee shops. 
is largely motivated by the idea that if you separate marijuana from the other drugs business, then it's less likely that people will be tempted to try other drugs. And they seem to have found that that's the case there. So in the States, I mean, it's, I think it'll be a few years before we really find out exactly what the results are. But so far, it seems promising to me. <coughs> Next question. Right there, just one, thanks. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I was reading a few articles about the cartels diversifying um, their expansions into like the avocado market, the rise of the blood avocados and how it was affecting the farmers in places like Michoacan and how it was very lucrative uh, for the cartels. Can you talk about that some? Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that's true. I mean, uh, just like any other business, they diversify in, in exactly the way that you'd expect. Um, they do this in various ways. I mean, one one way that they've been doing this is is in different types of drug. And so one interesting consequence, actually, or a partial consequence of the uh, legalization of marijuana is that some cartels, which used to make a lot of money out of marijuana, are now actually getting into heroin instead. And that's obviously not an entirely um, good consequence. Um, they also, they're, they're getting into other businesses too. I mean, they, they're getting, as you say, that some agricultural products they're doing more of, um, avocados, lime, uh, they're getting into mining in some parts of Mexico, in Michoacan. Um, but usually, I mean, wha the area where they've got the biggest sort of um, comparative advantage, if you like, is in the illegal stuff. So people smuggling is one area where they're getting much, much more involved. And I think there, there's, there's been a big difference actually in the past few decades that you can look at questionnaires that are done of uh, illegal migrants into the United States and the proportion who use a, a coyote a, you know a, a people smuggler has gone up a lot back in the 1970s the majority didn't use any kind of professional help to get in whereas the latest studies suggest that you know 90 odd percent of people do and the people who are really cashing in on that market are the organized crime groups because it's become a lot harder to cross the border in, in recent years it's become much much more difficult and so it requires greater expertise, and the people best placed to, to do that are the cartels. And you, you can do, the, in, in the book actually, I've got a chart which plots the number of hours spent patrolling the border with the average price charged by a coyote, and the two are perfectly correlated. As the, as the amount of enforcement has gone up, the average price has gone up as well. And so it's, you know, the worry is that in, in doing that, we've created a, you know, a much bigger criminal market, something that used to be uh, you know, migration used to be done usually without professional help and when it when people did get help it was fairly cheap now it nearly always involves professional help and it's very expensive so it's a big new money spinner for the cartels so yeah they get into all kinds of things you find also uh, in some parts of Mexico um, the setters are, are involved in things like pirate DVDs and bootleg alcohol and you even find that they put their logo on, on some of these products that they sell in, in uh, markets in Mexico. So yeah, it's extraordinary. They're, they're into everything, just, just as you would expect. <coughs> Next question. On the, the side here, thanks. There's a microphone there, please, thanks. We got some information that indicates that the amount of uh, drug activity has continually increased regarding uh, truck uh, trucks coming in over the border. Uh, why is that not a possible way to slow down the traffic or stop the traffic to some degree. I mean, why does that continue to increase when you have all the border crossing, uh, testing and uh, stopping and so on? Well, I think the, I think the lesson of the war on drugs over the past several decades is that it's, it's, it is just simply very, very hard to clamp down on a market this popular when you've got so many people who want to try this product and so many people willing to supply it, that sheer enforcement is, is not really going to do the job. But the, I think the difficult thing as well, and this is something that President Calderon in Mexico often used to say, that the more you clamp down, the harder you make it to for, for the drug to get in, the, the more you end up increasing its price. And so the more you increase incentives for people to get it in in the first place. And so I think with the with the trucking example that you give, uh, the precisely the mechanics of it, I think, uh, are that the the value of the drugs being smuggled in are so great that really whatever you pay border guards in Mexico and whatever you pay them in the United States, it's not going to be that difficult for cartels to corrupt people because the money involved is, is just gigantic. The price of um, a kilo of cocaine in Colombia is sort of 
maybe four or five thousand dollars when it's first been refined and by the time it makes it into america it's about twenty thousand dollars by the time it makes it to dealers it's seventy thousand dollars and by the time it makes it to consumers it's doubled again and with margins like that it's it's easy to see why it's so easy to overcome these problems why it's so easy to bribe people enough to let the stuff in or or tunnel far enough to let the stuff in um i think all these enforcement efforts are up against a, a business which is rich enough really to outspend them this question just by just there in the, in the center yes oh thank you i apologize for the extra question but <coughs> Are you, are you familiar with a book uh, called uh, The Fail War by Castañeda and Aguilar in Mexico? The, uh, sorry, which, which of their books? Uh, it's it's uh, The Fail War, the trans in Spanish it's La Guerra Fallida. Actually, no, I, I've read some stuff, but I, I think I can probably guess what it says. But right, right, <laughs> no, right. I, I don't know that one. No. Well, in, in, in the book, uh, as, as you'd expect, uh, they show all these statistics about how the, the premises that Calderón used in the war were wrong, right? Like, for example, he used the argument that there was increased cartel-induced violence in the country. That there was um, that Mexico was the young people were in danger of like high consumption of drugs, and he just showed all these statistics about how Mexico is like the least cons uh, consuming country of marijuana and drugs in the world, actually, and how like there was actually not much violence before he declared war to the cartels. So like, given that the premises were wrong according to statistics, I'm hoping they're correct, right? I mean, it's, these are very serious people. Uh, what do you think were, th were the actual reasons then why Calderón felt the motivation to fight cartels like that? Thank you. It's a good question. I, I mean, I, I, I asked him that question myself, and the, the answer that he normally gives is that he, he I, I don't think he expected it to be quite such a, a long, long operation. He, the image that he often gives is of a, a surgeon who opens up a body expecting to excise one small tumor and finds that the cancer has spread throughout the body. Um, that's his version of events. I mean, people sometimes point out that the very, very close election result in 2006 put him in a very weak position. And his, I mean, you remember his inauguration was a, a farce. You know, the poor guy had to run out through the back door of Congress. And I think some people wonder if that experience made him particularly anxious to to get off with a really strong start you know to really show who was boss um that must have been partly tempting i i mean in terms of the, the calderon war i mean the, the the to put the other case briefly uh, for the first year or so people seemed to think it was going well you know the reports from the american embassy for the first year of calderon's war were actually very positive and the when things went wrong in, in Mexico, it's worth, I think it's worth bearing in mind that at the same time they were going wrong in Central America. It's, it's not the case that everywhere else in that region remained peaceful while Mexico, which had the Calderon strategy, went to hell. It, it, was a, it seemed to be a regional problem rather than simply a Calderon problem. Um, I, I mean, my, my sort of general feeling about this is that on the whole, we're sort of too likely, you know, we're too ready to attribute both successes and failures in the war on drugs to the policies of individual politicians. It seems to me that very often what's really going on is, is more a question of changing market forces. And in the case of Mexico, the, the big, big increase in violence that took place there was to a large extent the result of an increase in violence in Ciudad Juarez. And what was happening there was, you know, it, it didn't immediately seemed to me to be the result of a government policy. It, it, it seemed that what was going on there was that Sinaloa was making a play for the territory held by Juarez. And it was, I think, retrospectively, the, you know, the government's actions didn't help because what seems to have happened in the end was that the Sinaloa cartel was able to co-opt some of the federal police and the army to fight against the state police that were run by, by Juarez. So that's how the story goes. Um, but I... I think you've got to be careful. There's no counterfactual. And uh, I suspect that had Calderon not done what he did, Mexico still would have had a very tough few years. And uh, equally, I think the, the fall in violence that we've seen over the past sort of three years, although it seems to be ticking up again now, but the, you know, the fall that we saw between 2011 and 2015, I don't think you can attribute that to 
good government policies. I, I think that, again, is due to changing market forces. So, yeah, the Calderon strategy will not go down in history as a success, but I, I would be cautious about pinning everything on him, whether it's success or failure. Next question. In the front row here, Wishing. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. You convinced me that it's good to be in the drug business <laughs> and we should look into it. Uh, but I have a question. With all your findings and so on, how would you advise President Trump after building the wall about 30 feet high to fight the cartel? And, and it's a serious question. How should the United States fight the cartels? It's a good question. I mean, my <laughs> I don't know what my advice to President Trump would be. I think the... <laughs> resign, possibly, but... Um, <laughs> but no, my, my advice to, to whoever wins that election in November and um, not, you know, not just to the President of the United States, but my advice to any government really would be that the, I think the, the place where we've really gone wrong is in focusing on the supply side of this business rather than the demand side. It's, you know, it, like any business, it has those two halves. And if you look at what governments have done in, in the past decades, there's been a very, very heavy emphasis on interrupting supply. Um, and my, my guess based on what I've seen is that we'd have more luck if we looked at demand. I think the trouble with supply is, is that if you picture, I, <laughs> I feel like I need a whiteboard to do this really, but if you picture the, the market for drugs, the demand for most illegal drugs is inelastic. I mean, you know, it doesn't respond very much to price changes. And that's what you'd expect really from any addictive product. So the price goes up a bit, consumption doesn't go down much. And what this means is that even if you do manage to reduce supply, what you're going to find is that price goes up quite a lot and the quantity consumed doesn't fall very much. In other words, all, all you succeed in doing is inflating the value of, of the criminal markets and putting more money into, um, into the groups that run it. And if you focus on demand, by contrast, then you, know, you can shift that supply curve, to uh, the demand curve back to the left. And you'll, uh, what, what you ought to do there, theoretically, is reduce the price and reduce the quantity consumed. And it seems, I mean, there are good examples of how this does indeed seem to be the case. There was a good study done a few years ago looking at um, different interventions in the war on drugs. And it compared the effect of spending a million dollars at various different points in, in the supply chain. Um, and it, it looked at how much you reduced the consumption of cocaine by for, for this million dollars spent. And what it found was that for every million dollars that you spend on reducing supply in South America, you reduce the amount of cocaine consumed in the US by about 10 kilos. And for every million dollars spent on education in US schools, you reduce it by about 20 kilos. And for every million dollars spent on treatment for addicts in the United States, you reduce it by about 100 kilos, so 10 times more effective. So my kind of very broad advice to Trump, and you know, let's hope it's not him, um, would be to, to focus more on the demand side and less on the supply side, because we're already spending plenty of money. I just think it, we'd have more success if we, we redirected it. Next question, Wishing in the front corner there. To what do you uh, attribute Colombia's success over the last couple decades, and what lessons can we draw from that more broadly? It's a good question. I, I should start by admitting Colombia is not my country of expertise, but the I think one thing that you notice if you look at the um, the cocaine business, and uh, there may be actually I was just looking at some of this information that was handed out earlier. I uh, know this doesn't go back quite far enough. If you if you look at the cultivation of um, coca leaf, it's, it's quite interesting. You, over the years, governments have managed to reduce it in some countries, but you tend to find that often as it's reduced in some places, it tends to go up by the same amount in others. And the story in, in that part of the world was that for many years, um, Peru was actually the main uh, supplier of, of the world's coca leaf. And there was a big, big intensive effort to reduce the amount of cultivation of uh, coca leaf in Peru. And just as it fell in Peru, it, it went into Colombia. And then there was a big, big effort to drive the, uh, the coca production down in Colombia. And it was successful. It went down. But as you may have guessed, it, it went straight back to Peru. And each time the United Nations declared this uh, an enormous success because it had gone down in one country, ignoring the fact that it had gone up in another. So Colombia's success, I, I'd, I'd be cautious about um, describing it as a sort of pure success, because very often you find that success in one area 
is accompanied by a, a sort of failure of equal measure somewhere else. And we've seen something like that actually um, elsewhere in the region. That for a long time, the Caribbean was um, the big sort of stepping stone for cocaine going to the United States. You remember back in the sort of Miami Vice days, it often used to go through there. And there was a very, very successful effort led by um, George Bush, the elder, to cut that down. And, and it really worked. You know, the Caribbean uh, became a, a much, much smaller center of drug trafficking than than it is now. But it was at exactly that time that the problems began in Mexico because people, instead of going through the Caribbean, started going through Mexico instead. And lately we've seen possibly something similar happening again, where uh, as the government in Mexico has really put the squeeze on, countries in Central America have started having very serious problems themselves. I, I mentioned El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. Uh, those are other countries that have had big problems too. So I, I'd be cautious about, you know, praising too much the success of one place without looking at the whole region. Um, I mean, in Colombia, from, from what little I know about that place, that they talk about some policies, including things like um, a kind of central command of the police. That's one interesting difference, actually, between Colombia and Mexico. They In Colombia, they've got one single police force, whereas in Mexico, they've got more than 2,000. And it very often in Mexico, they, they say that a useful thing to do would be to amalgamate these different forces. Um, and that is a problem. I remember once, actually, I was in Monterey and I was speaking to um, someone there involved in security and he was telling me how different police forces and different municipalities use different types of radio and so they couldn't even talk to each other. It meant, you know, the people they were pursuing could just jump over the border from one municipality to the other. And so in Colombia, one thing they've done is amalgamate those forces, which possibly helped. Um, but the broader point is, is to look not at individual countries, but at the region as a whole. Next question. Just about here in the third row. <coughs> sure. So a question a little bit on the flip side. If I was running a cartel, what do you think they do badly? How do you think they could be more profitable? It's <laughs> a very good question. Um, we're seeing this actually to some extent. If you go to Colorado, you, you, you can look at how the cartels are being outcompeted. And they're being pretty solidly beaten, actually, by the legal businesses. And, and the things that they really fall down on, there are various things. They, the cartels still, by most estimates, they still provide the cheapest marijuana. The, the illegal stuff is still cheaper than the legal stuff. But it's much, much weaker. I mean, the average sort of illegal Mexican marijuana in that part of the world is, is has about sort of 6% THC or thereabouts. Whereas if you go into a dispensary in, in Denver, most of the stuff they're selling is more like sort of 18%, so it's about three times as potent. So my advice to uh, <laughs> to the Sinaloa cartel or, or whoever would be that they, you know, they need to get some serious kind of agribusiness people in there because that's that's what the you know the legal businesses are doing. You, know, you you go and speak to the people running those warehouses in Denver, and they're very often people who have backgrounds in in agriculture. So that's one thing. Um, another interesting thing, actually, the in uh, that you see in Colorado, the the big big um, kind of star performer of the legal marijuana market has been the edibles sector. And this is really a new thing. I mean, people have been, you know, cooking hash brownies forever, but it's not something that organized crime has ever really got into. As far as I know, the Sinaloa cartel don't do hash brownies. <laughs> um, and yet they've proved incredibly popular. I mean, people are, are really getting into these, uh, you know, not just the cakes, but the sweets and the, the drinks. It's an interesting one. You know, cannabis drinks is... is quite a big new business in Colorado. So that's something that I think cartels, you know, w ought to look at if they want to stay in the marijuana business. My guess, though, actually, is that they're probably going to give up on it because the evidence on the whole is that when a business becomes legal, it becomes very, very difficult for cartels, for, you know, for, for the illegal industry to survive. That's the experience with alcohol and with cigarettes. And you tend to find, I mean... With legal markets, you don't completely get rid of the black market. There's a fairly, fairly big illegal market for cigarettes and for alcohol. I mean, I know in Britain, the, the about 15% or so of cigarettes in circulation are illegal ones. But they don't tend to be provided by cartels. You know, these are illegal in the sense of being it's more of a kind of grey market, if you like. It's, it's legal stuff which is diverted and, and not taxed. So I think probably the cartels will try and get out of, of that. Um, and focus on the drugs which are still illegal, because it's of course it's the illegal ones where the cartels ha have their business protected effectively. So that's I think that's probably what they're going to do. They're going to focus on the stuff that's still banned. And as 
as possibly more and more varieties are legalized, they're going to find themselves focusing on a narrower and narrower band of, of drugs. Next question, just about in there, just to your right. There it is. So as you recommend a shift towards the economic perspective and looking at drugs from a marketplace, what impact do you see to the anti-money laundering paradigm and efforts in terms of the role that financial institutions can play in that effort? Thank you, sorry, I can't see you very well, but it's a good question. Um, well, we're seeing that a little bit. I mean, when I was in Mexico, there was this case of HSBC, which got busted for money laundering, and, and they were uh, really, uh, the failure, their failure to monitor the accounts of these people was just incredible. There was one branch where supposedly they'd built a sort of letterbox for these, these suitcases of cash to be pushed through. Um, there's not a great deal going on, though, actually. I, I think that's one area where much more could be done. It, it seems that so far the fines against banks for doing this kind of thing have been fairly minimal and the criminal prosecutions on the whole have been precisely zero. And I think that's an area where much more could be done. And I think if you want to do more in that area, really, you're getting into bigger questions of financial regulation because the, the reasons, as I recall it, for not fining HSBC more in, uh, in that case w was that if you find it that much, then you risked destabilizing the banking system. In other words, it was you know too too big to fail, too big to be fined. So that argues for you know a, a breakup of these big banks, and I mean that's that's getting onto um, a much much bigger question. I mean there are small things that can be done. One thing that's just under discussion at the moment in the European Union is abolishing the, the 500 euro note, which is an extraordinary high currency note. I mean it's as far as I know it's used exclusively by criminals. Um, it's it's sometimes known as a bin Laden because everybody knows it exists, but you never see it. <laughs> and um, they're, th but they're talking about abolishing those now for exactly this reason. They're, they're very concerned that um, they're used only by criminals. And there's some interesting fact about the, I forget the proportion, but some huge proportion of all the 500 euro notes in circulation are found in Spain, which not coincidentally is the place into which most cocaine comes into Europe. So getting rid of that will help. But I think, you know, more broadly, there's there's lots more that can be done uh, against money laundering, but it's all stuff that will require much, much deeper reforms of, of the financial sector. Next question here, uh, in the front row. Again, thanks. Thank you again for being here. Um, w in approaching this from a business perspective, do you think it might be, w wh what are your thoughts in approaching this with respect to not going after the narcotics per se, but the spin-off industries that come from it, for example, two principally weapons and unfortunately uh, sex slave trafficking, attacking those two as a means of squeezing the narcotics trade? It's a good question. The, I mean, with, with the guns, that's certainly something that you hear a lot about in Mexico. I mean, the, the Mexicans are very quick to point out, rightly, that most of the guns used by the Mexican cartels come from this country. The, the, I think the figure given by the United States Embassy in Mexico City is it's something in the region of 90% of, of the weapons recovered are, are ones that have originated in the United States. Um, and stricter, I mean, stricter gun controls, I think, are something that would be a good idea for all kinds of reasons. I mean, th this is a big debate in this country that, unfortunately, I'd, I'm not sure that you're going to fix, really. Uh, I, from what I've seen, it's, it doesn't seem to be getting any closer to, to a resolution, but certainly it would be um, a useful thing from Mexico's point of view and, and bad news for the cartels if, if it were harder for them to get rid of, to get hold of their weapons. Um, in terms of other businesses, the I'm not. I'm not quite sure about this. I mean, the the sex trafficking business. It's true that it's it's linked to the same criminal groups because they, you know, they're they're experts in smuggling things over the border, and so they get more into people smuggling, and for that reason, they get more into uh, people trafficking. Um, but I don't. I'm not. I'm not certain that it's the case that cracking down on that would particularly weaken the cartels. I mean, it's not their main line of business. Um, it's it, it would deprive them of you know some of their income definitely but as far as I know that there's no obvious way in which the sex trafficking business somehow facilitates the drug trafficking business it's it's a it's a spin-off of the drug trafficking business but not one that I think would would really damage the the drug side of things if, if it were tackled um, that's no less reason for tackling it obviously but 
I'm I, I don't know if I quite understand your your point, but I, I'm I'm not sure that it would necessarily impact the drug side of things very much, but should certainly be tackled. This person here in the front row, Wei thank you. Thank you. What what do you think accounts for the large increase in demand that we seem to be hearing about, and how do we you? I agree with you. I think the demand is what has to be approached, but it's not just how we have, what's causing this increase in demand. Uh, we see up in the northeastern states, they're very disturbed about it. Uh, something new, for relatively new, and uh, I think it's a, what is, what is the problem and how do we, it's a societal problem. So what are the causes? It's a good question. Uh, it depends really, and, and demand, you know, it, it's not only going up, actually, it's, it's important to be clear that the demand for some drugs is falling. In, in the United States, in the past few years, there's actually been a fairly encouraging fall in demand for cocaine. The, the cocaine consumption has gone down quite a bit. At the same time, it's gone up by almost exactly the same amount in Western Europe, which is why I, I, you know, I wouldn't chalk that up as a, a big, big success. Um, but in terms of increasing demand, I mean, the one of the interesting ones in recent years, and I don't know if this is what you were referring to, but heroin is, seems to be back in a, a big way in the United States. And it seems that the big reason for that I is the big increase in the number of people dependent on prescription painkillers. And that's, that's a huge, huge thing. And it's, it's an interesting one from the point of the cartels. That's presented them with a, a very big new market. And, and the, the mechanism is that people are prescribed these prescri prescription painkillers, they get hooked on them, the doctor then withdraws the prescription and they turn to heroin because it scratches the same itch, basically. And it's really, for the cartels, it's an interesting one because it's, it's created a very different sort of market. The typical heroin consumer in the United States has changed totally in, in the space of a generation. If you look back to the 1960s and 70s, a typical heroin addict in America was male, was black, and first age of first use was about 16 or 17, very, very young. Now the average heroin user in America, average heroin addict, is female. It's roughly 50-50, but women are in the slight majority. Um, they're white, and the average age has gone up to something like 25 for first use, which in drug terms is quite old. And for the cartels, this is a you know a great big new market for them. It's a you know it's it's a big represents a big opportunity for them. Um, and the yeah, it's it's down to this this mechanism of, of transference from prescription painkillers. And I, I interviewed this lady um, in Colorado who, you know, she, she wasn't how you would sort of picture a typical heroin addict. She was, I guess she was in her 60s, she was a grandmother, you know, she was a very kind of middle-class person. She had a full-time job and she told me about how she'd ended up becoming addicted to heroin. And, and it was, she'd been given a gigantic prescription of um, painkillers for some injury that she'd sustained, become addicted, um, the prescription got cut down and she couldn't afford to carry on buying the stuff on the black market. And so through some friend of her daughter, she, she got hooked up to someone who was selling heroin and she, to her astonishment, found herself smoking heroin. And this is a you know a big worrying new trend. And in, so in, in that case, the demand comes from this quite specific cause, I think. It's, it's the very ready availability of these prescription painkillers. And I think, you know, th the impression I get is that efforts have been made to tighten up the control of these uh, quite a lot. Um, but more needs to be done on that front because th this is a big new worry for the United States. <coughs> Next question. Just there, just there. Yes. Hi. Um, can you speak a little bit about the aspect of forced recruitment in this business? Um, I've worked in the asylum and refugee community for a number of years now, and my understanding is that not everybody who works in this industry wants to be working in this industry. A lot of people are threatened. <laughs> so how does that play into, like I really liked your analogy of why in Europe there's this customer service aspect, but in Latin America there isn't, and that's why there's so much violence. But if there's such a large number of employees available, why is there so much um, resorting to forced recruitment? Um, in particular, the cocoa fields um, in Colombia to the smuggling business of Mexico. Very good question. The I think they sort of tie into each other. Actually, the when I was talking about how prisons are, are used often as a 
a means of recruiting. Very often the recruiting that's done there is, is not entirely voluntarily. I mean, the in, in some countries, like in El Salvador, for instance, the, the place I mentioned, there what you find is that the prisons are informally um, divided up among the different gangs. And the idea behind this is to prevent fighting because th the idea is that if you had members of the two different gangs in the same prison, you'd see more violence. So what they do is they, they say, okay, this, this prison unofficially belongs to the 18th Street gang and this one unofficially is for the Mara Salvatrucha. But the trouble is that, of course, it, it means that it, it makes it that much easier for them to recruit. And in a prison like the one that I visited where I went to interview the guy that I was talking about, um, you know, if, if you're not a member of that gang when you go in, you certainly will be by the time you leave. And it's it, people very often there are, are recruited against their will. And if not against their will, then very often they join gangs for their own protection. Because these prisons, as you know, are horribly violent places. And often people join gangs as, as the only way of um, protecting themselves, which is a, a kind of semi-voluntary uh, semi voluntary way of, of joining up. I mean, there are, there are other... Other examples which are more worrying still that come from Mexico, I mean, there, there are cases that you'll have seen where um, migrants heading for the border are, are rounded up and forced to join the um, the gangs there. Gangs like the Zetas have a reputation for doing this. And I suppose for them it's just it's just another way of, of getting the kind of manpower that they need. I mean, it's you could argue, some people argue that all of this suggests that the the sort of pressure put on these cartels in that part of the world is having some effect. I mean, it's, it's not a good effect in this case, but I remember talking to somebody who um, was saying that they had discovered among uh, Zetas fighters killed in northeastern Mexico, they'd found a growing proportion of people who seemed to have come from Guatemala. And the person I was speaking to saw this as, a, you know, some evidence that perhaps the putting the squeeze on the Zetas in, in northeastern Mexico had sort of deprived them of, of the human resources that they needed. And so they were importing more people from abroad. So it could be the case that, you know, in in cases like these sort of um, forced recruitment examples in places like Tamaulipas, that what you're seeing there is, you know, could, could be the effect of a, a squeeze on the labor market, actually. And that's, that's a good point. You know, that could be a unintended effect. It, it may be that rather than using less violence, they... Um, hire more people in from elsewhere to do the violence for them. So yeah, it's certainly worth, worth bearing in mind. <coughs> so just one more question. To this one here, this one, please. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again for uh, sharing your insights and experience tonight. Uh, um, you mentioned a couple of different kind of corporate functions you've noticed in these cartels, like human resources, uh, supply chain. Have you noticed other ones like um, marketing or PR, uh, maybe like research, is there like a bunch of people that study like these coming uh, government regulations, for example, or anything like that? Absolutely. No, no, that's that's absolutely right. And if you, the, the book is actually organized on that basis. Each chapter covers a different aspect of their their um, their business. And there's a chapter on PR and there's a chapter on um, research and development and online retailing is something they're getting into. Um, but the, yeah, the w one of the ones that surprises people actually is that they, regarding their PR, they, they take that quite seriously and I mean the capture of this guy El Chapo was partly it seems because he was so anxious to, to have a film made of his life that he got these guys Sean Penn and um, Kate Del Castillo to go and talk to him about that. The one side of this that surprises people often is, is that cartels have a sort of weird interest in something that resembles corporate social responsibility and it's important to be clear that they're entirely cynical about this, you know, j just as <laughs> just as many other firms are rather cynical about their CSR. Um, but the what they what the cartels really need in many places is support from local people, and it's surprising that in some areas they do. Uh, when the last time El Chapo was captured, there was a opinion poll carried out by Reforma, one of the newspapers in Mexico, um, and it found that some kind of fairly large minority of people actually disapproved of his capture and the way that the cartels manage to win support in these areas is often by providing services that the state doesn't provide and you find that in some parts of Mexico cartels have paid for the construction of churches and they've paid for the construction of, of housing in some places or sports fields and in some places they set up sort of primitive social security systems and I had this strange experience of um, going to meet this lady she, she was um, 
someone who worked as a, a cleaner in Mexico City for someone that I knew, a, a contact who got in touch with me and said, you know, I think you should come around and interview my cleaning lady. And so I said, well, what, you know, what's going on? So I went to see her and um, we sat down and she was this very sort of um, cosy lady of 70 something. And she told me that she was planning uh, to have somebody murdered. And so we, you know, we talked about this and I was rather surprised. And it, it turned out that what was going on was that in her village where she lived, which is a very poor village on the edge of Mexico City, there was a group of guys going around basically terrorizing people. They were robbing people's houses. They were assaulting people. And the people who lived in the village had gone to the police and said, you know, you've got to do something about this. You've got to help us. But the police were so corrupt and so hopeless that they'd done nothing. And so the local organized crime group had got in touch and said, hey, look, you know, we realize you've got a problem with these guys. We know just how to sort these guys out. You know, this is just what we specialize in doing. And so the local people had said, oh, well, okay, you know, that's that, that sounds good. And so they were preparing to to organize this hit. And it's just, it's one example of the ways in which these organized crime groups sometimes provide a, a kind of grim type of public service to people as a, as a way of trying to get them on side. And they, in some parts of Mexico, they provide sort of basic security of that type. They provide in some areas a sort of um, uh, business mediation service which, with, with which few people are willing to... Um, <laughs> dispute um, and they um, they do all of this stuff and it's you know it's entirely cynical it's because they need the support of local people to avoid being reported so yeah PR marketing corporate social responsibility it's, it's all stuff that they take surprisingly seriously I'm afraid that's all we have time for but please join me in thanking Mr. Tom Wainwright <laughs>